Hope you got into a good conversation with someone. Hey, Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Um, you know, I think sometimes Happy New Year is a wish, sometimes it's a prayer, and sometimes it's a reality. So wherever you're at today, Happy New Year. And um, my name is Stephanie. I'm the lead pastor here at Mill City. Special welcome to any of you who are maybe visiting for one of the first few times. Those of you who are online, who are joining us, we're super grateful to have you come uh, connect with Mill City. And we would love to meet you, to answer any questions you have. So please let us do that. And I would love a chance to meet any one of you who I haven't had a chance to do that, to, to make a connection with a name and some eyeballs. I would love to do that. That would be great. So let me just fill in anyone who is just joining us maybe today or in the last few weeks. When we look back on 2021 at Mill City Church, we did something a little audacious, and we decided we were going to go through the entire Bible last year, okay, the entire story. Uh, sometimes we call it the meta-narrative or the story of the stories, God's big story, we call it with the kids, the big God story. And we went through the whole story in a specific way, and it was by genre, by genre of scripture, because we know in the Bible there's a lot of different genres, and so we looked at historical narrative, we looked at the law genre, we went through wisdom and poetry literature, we went through the, the um, different parts of the prophets, we jumped into the story of Acts and the Gospels and the early church and all, the, all of that, and then we ended with Advent where we looked at Isaiah's prophecy hundreds of years before Jesus was born about Jesus being the Messiah. And here we are now in 2022, and we're going to do something pretty different than what we did last year. This year, we're going to just dig really deep into a few books of the Bible, just a few of the, of the specific books. So we're starting with the Gospel of Matthew, all right, which is the first book of the New Testament. And we're going to be going through di deep dive in the book of Matthew. Y'all, we're going to be in this book through Easter at least. So just keep your finger in Matthew, okay? That's where we're at, or keep your app there, all right? Um, and I'm really excited about this opportunity. If you've been around me at all, you know that I'm always saying, our only hope is Jesus. Our only hope is Jesus. Jesus is our only hope. The kingdom of God and joining in that kingdom and not the little kingdoms I often call it of the world. This is it. Seeking first the kingdom of God is what it's all about if we're going to have uh, a year in which we get to join what God's doing. And so I love that we're starting the year off digging deep into the story of Jesus, Matthew's account, his disciples, Matthew, uh, his account of Jesus' life, his teachings, his death, but also his resurrection. So I hope you're excited about that as well. I do want to let you know we have some resources for you. For those of you who are like, deep dive, let's do it. Head to millcitychurch.com slash discipleship. We often have different resources there for you. You'll see that there's a page, deep dive in Matthew page. Um, I'm excited about that. And um, slight flex, we have somebody who agreed to teach a class in February for our equipping classes, who is my friend, slight flex, Dr. Janine Brown, who literally wrote the book the book, this is Matthew, a commentary by Dr. Janine Brown, who's going to teach a class for Mill City Church. How cool is that? Right? So she is going to help us do this deep dive. I'm so excited about that. It's such a privilege to have folks who are willing to invest in us like that. Um, so it's going to be great. Now, I also want to mention that last year, there was a handful of people who made it through the entire year reading the Bible together uh, through an app. They were able to connect with each other. And they said it was so meaningful. So we want to give it an opportunity for those of you who said, that sounds cool. I want to give it a try this year. And so if you go to millcitychurch.com slash discipleship, you can join in with some other people who already said, hey, we're going to give it a go. And it's just an, an experiment, an experience. It's not, you know, an assignment as much as a time to connect with other people. And they said, I never, some people said, I'd never done that before. And it was so cool to do that alongside some other people uh, with the connection the internet offers. So if you want to do that, millcitychurch.com slash discipleship. So once again, deep dive into Matthew. And the way we're going to start off this conversation is we're calling it Away in the Wilderness. Away in the Wilderness. And that's because right here in the beginning of Matthew, we see this theme of the wilderness come to the surface. And, and you see this theme in Scripture throughout. And this is such a, a relevant thing for us because when you ask the question, what are you looking forward to in 2022, some of you probably had an answer right away. Others of you probably had to think about it, and some of you are just mad that we asked the question. And that's all right. When I think about 2022, I'm, I'm excited about some things. But if I'm honest, the things I'm excited about are things that are actually because of a challenge. Have you noticed that sometimes the things we get the most excited about is when something happens that overcomes a challenge in the world or in our lives? That's what we get excited about. And so, for instance, I'm really excited because I think uh, in the housing and homelessness initiative we've been a part of as a community, some of you have been a part of that, uh, there's going to be some really cool breakthroughs in the next few weeks. I'm trusting God for that. If you could pray for the people who are a part of that team, there's some important meetings this week where I think 
I think God is going to lead us to house some people who are not already housed or don't have that opportunity because of God's leadership in our lives. And that is exciting to me. But it's exciting because of this challenge that people don't have enough affordable housing in our city. And so you see how challenge and excitement and what we're looking forward to often comes from the challenging things. And this wilderness theme that we see in scripture is kind of symbolic for, for challenging times or times of waiting or wondering and confusion or uh, struggle. And we see this theme throughout. But if you think about it, that's what makes things exciting is to see when God makes a way in the wilderness that only God could make. There's something about that that is the kind of thing that I look forward to the most. And it comes with the challenges that we face. So I know that nobody hopes for challenges in the new year, but we all know that they're going to come. But I know that when God does things, when God works and God makes a way in the wilderness, those are some of the most exciting and most uh, invigorating experiences for us. And so as we look at the beginning of Matthew, we're going to see this wilderness theme come in right away. So if you have a Bible, we're going to be in Matthew 3. So you remember, um, j if you look in, the, in, in Matthew, you'll see chapter 1 and chapter 2 are really covering the, the Christmas story, the story of Jesus' birth and kind of what happens right after he's born that we covered in Advent. And then right away in chapter 3, we see Jesus' cousin John. People often call him John the Baptist. I like to call him Cousin John. So Cousin John is, is right away in chapter 3, you see this wilderness theme. And I think you'll see it. I'm going to read 1 through 6, and you'll notice it right away. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. I'm here for the honey part. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all of Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. So right away here, Matthew's account of this story, the Gospel of Matthew, he points out right there in verse 3 that John is fulfilling the prophecy about, about John the Baptist in Isaiah hundreds of years ago, that there was going to be a voice that cried out in the wilderness saying, prepare the way for the Lord or make way, the Messiah is coming. The Messiah is coming. And, and this is this core theme that we see in the book of Matthew that we, or in, throughout the whole book of Matthew that John says here. He says, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. So this is my, my foundation for you all. If someone says, what's the major theme of the book of Matthew? It's that the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is in our midst. It's coming. And it's coming because of Jesus, the Messiah. And we know that, the, that Matthew was writing primarily to a Jewish audience, and, and a first century Jew Jewish audience, which is not us. We're not a first century Jewish community. So we need to be thinking about, they're receiving this maybe a little different than we are. They're people who are waiting for this Messiah and saying, where is this Messiah? And they felt that they had waited for a long time. And here, John is this guy in the wilderness eating locusts and honey saying, He's coming. He's here. He's coming right behind me. All right? And, and he was going to, to be, Jesus was going to be, what I often say, a new kind of king of a new kind of kingdom. And so we'll put this up here on the screen around the kingdom of God. That's language some of you are familiar with. And if you're not, that's all right. We're going to be, like I said, it's the theme, big theme of Matthew. So we'll be talking about it quite a bit. But here's the, the, just the way I want you to think about it. When we talk about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, when you hear John say this here in the passage or you hear Jesus talk about the kingdom of God is like or the kingdom of is, is in our midst, what I want you to think about is the reign of God. The, the reign of God. Now this is the God who, Scripture says, is love. This is a God who loved us so much that he came down to become one of us and to live amongst us. This is a God who wanted to prove that God never gives up on humans so much that he gave up his life on the cross and conquered death on our behalf. This is that God. So when that God reigns in a situation, what does that look like? That's what we mean by the kingdom of God. Very practically, think right now about something in your life that's been a struggle maybe personally or in your family. Just in your mind, think about that. Think about one of the issues in the world today that you feel most burdened by. There's some obvious ones, but think about that for a minute. What would the reign of God in that situation look like? And you can't maybe, you know, answer that with precision, 
But when the, when the God of love comes into that struggle and that situation, wrong things are made right. Things are restored. This is what John is saying. That kingdom is coming, that reign of God is coming in your midst. Because in, in the midst of the little kingdoms, like I call it, there's a lot of brokenness and a lot of pain and a lot of suffering. But when the reign of God comes into those situations, God makes a way even in the wilderness. And so here we see John in the wilderness saying that God, God's kingdom is coming near. The kingdom of heaven has come near. And you should repent or turn your mind towards God. Turn around. Look at God because God is doing something. The kingdom of God is in our midst. So that's what we mean when we talk about the reign of God, that God's reign would come into a situation and change reality. And some of us have experienced what happens when God's reign comes into a situation and changes reality in a way that only God could do. Because God makes a way in the wilderness. So remember here in this story, people are heading out from the cities. Did you notice that? From Jerusalem, from Judea, from the area of the Jordan. They're heading out from these cities out into the wilderness because something's happening there. They want to hear from Cousin John. So they're heading from the city to the wilderness. Now, I am not one who chooses to do that very often. I know some of you are those people. You're the people who are like, I'm going to get lost in the wilderness on purpose. Who are you camping people? Come on, be honest. Look, I don't understand you. I love you, but I don't get it, all right? I prefer to sleep in a place where there's walls, you know? And that's my preference. However, like about every 10 years, someone convinces me to go camping, all right? And some of you know that this time last year, last winter, uh, my husband and I, I don't even think that you convinced me. I think that we just decided maybe, who knows? I was led out into the wilderness in northern Arizona, did you know that it's cold in the mountains in northern Arizona? I didn't know that. Turns out we were winter camping. Didn't know. So we got there. Rookie mistake. So we're, it's freezing. It's like six degrees. Not, not, you know, it's chilly today, but it was a little warmer then. But it was like six degrees. We're winter camping. Rookie mistake. Rookie mistake number two. I turned on the GPS, put the coordinates for the campsite in the GPS, started driving, and the GPS just ended in the wilderness. <laughs> like we were in the middle of the wilderness. And we eventually got out of the wilderness, turned around, followed our tracks, yada, yada. We got out of there. Um, and then I went back and looked at the email from the campsite that said, do not trust your GPS. Does anyone feel like these last couple of years needed a warning like that? Like, do not trust your plans, okay? Because the GPS ended, did it not? <laughs> like, and I'm just not used to that, you know? Elder millennial, I'm used to my GPS working for the last little bit here. So I literally was without a map. And that's how we feel in life, isn't it? We feel like the GPS just ended. We feel like we can't trust the plan. We can't trust the map. And the truth is, is that we never could. But we get into experiences like these last couple of years, and some of you are like, listen, let me tell you about the years before that for me and my family. You get into these experiences, these wilderness experiences, and what we realize is certainty truly is a myth. That we can have the assurance of God with us, but we don't get to know the plan. There's a, a, a pastor that I really admire who has this quote, and I, I'm not going to say that I love this quote, but it's meaningful quote. <laughs> and this is, this is what she says, Pastor Barbara Brown Taylor. She says, human beings do not lose control of their lives. What we lose is the illusion that we were ever in control of our lives in the first place. God's story <laughs> has a wilderness theme throughout because our lives have wilderness experiences throughout, don't they? And God knows that. But here's the reality, is that God works in the wilderness. And we get to bear witness to that. God works in the wilderness, and we get to bear witness. Now, I don't often let everybody into my sermon prep, but I will let you know, I googled to make sure I was spelling bear correctly. It is bear, like a bear in the wilderness. Okay? Not like not wearing clothes. Okay? That would have been embarrassing if I would have put that. So, you know what? There's a happy bear in the wilderness to remind us that we get to choose to see what God is doing in the wilderness and we get to bear witness. I know that's a terrible joke. I blame my husband. All right. So, but you'll remember it now, right? You remember the bear. God works in the wilderness. God works in the wilderness. And Cousin John has a few more things to say here that I think give us a clue as to how God works in the wilderness. Remember, people are coming from all these cities out to the wilderness some people who probably did not spend very much time in the wilderness. And some of those people were some unexpected people that Scripture here calls the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Two terms for the, the religious elite, these religious leaders 
who we know from the rest of the story were pretty corrupt at this time. These people were not people to be trusted. And because John is a prophet or someone who is coming in to say this is what God cares about, John's response to them is pretty intense. I'll say that, all right? So let me pick it up in uh, verse 7. I'm just going to read verse 7. But when he, John, saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Okay, so that's intense. Now, some of you are like, why are we picking on snakes? I know you people that like the snakes and their pets and things. Look, I don't think he's picking on snakes. He's actually specifically calling them vipers for a reason. And when you look into it, uh, and actually this phrase, you brood of vipers, Jesus uses this phrase later on too. What does this mean? Well, a brood, baby, baby vipers, do you know what baby vipers are known to do? Kill their mothers after they're born. Okay, I didn't know that. I happened to say that out loud while my four-year-old niece was hearing me. And she's like, the vipers do what? And I was like, oh, yes, you know, let's not get into details. And she's like, those are some naughty snakes biting their mom. So this is what John's saying. John's saying, you naughty snakes, okay? And he's talking about this type of animal that doesn't respect where it's come from and doesn't, isn't faithful to its heritage, right? He's saying you're not being faithful to your heritage as children of Israel. You have forgotten who God is, and you're not living into who God made you to be. And it's pretty, pretty harsh to call them naughty snakes. That's what's happening. But then he continues on. Let me continue to read uh, in verse 8. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, he says to them. And do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. Now listen to this picture. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Then John says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one, Jesus of course, who is more powerful than I whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His, another image, his winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. All right, it's intense. He's a prophet. Prophets love like snarky images. And so here's where he's going. But remember that he's speaking to some people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who are so full of themselves that they're not even going to consider truly whether Jesus is the Messiah. And these are the same group of people who are going to have Jesus killed. Do you see how these are the people who are going to have Jesus killed to maintain the illusion of control that they think they have? This is why they do it. Because they've got a plan, and this guy is going to mess it up. Because they don't want their plans to not work out. They've got it all figured out. They want to keep their power. They want to keep their authority that they think they have in the community because they're abusing it so you can see why they want that. They are those who are going to miss what God is doing all together. And this is why John is trying to warn them with some pretty intense language. In the end, Jesus will forgive even them, won't he? And here John's trying to warn them, but these brash words, they fall on deaf ears. I think here, John's words, we see some of what God is doing in the wilderness. When we say God works in the wilderness, what do we mean? I think John's trying to point some of this out. But the question is, are we going to perceive it? Are we going to hear it? Are we going to see it? Because the Pharisees and the Sadducees, we know they do not. Last week I was in our uh, digital only Sunday. I, I got to share from Isaiah kind of that last time uh, in that weird weekend between Christmas and New Year's where we don't know what day it is. So, you know, you can go back and listen. And I, I was excited because I love this passage. I want to read it for you again today. Isaiah 43, 19. God says, see, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. This is what God's doing, making a way in the wilderness. And here we have documented what that looks like in the, in the coming of Jesus as the Messiah. He's making this way in the wilderness. But that question is so key. Do you perceive it? So we get to hold that question today. Will we perceive what God is doing? God is making a way in the wilderness. John is the voice crying out, in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. How are we prepared? So I see three things. I see three things that in John's words of warning, we could take with us to today and say, I'm going to choose to perceive it. I'm going to choose to perceive the, what God does in the wilderness. God works in the wilderness. 
and I'm going to bear witness to it. So first, we see that in the wilderness, number one, God can get our attention. In the wilderness where everything else is stripped away, we have a different opportunity, don't we? To pay attention to what God might be doing. We don't always choose that, but we can. I think that's part of what's so powerful about this. The beginning of Jesus' ministry doesn't start in the busy city of Jerusalem. It starts away in the wilderness with his cousin. So that everything else is gone to say, what is God trying to say? And we had that same opportunity when we experienced the wilderness too. To say, well, hey, this isn't exactly where I'd hope to be necessarily, but some things are stripped away. And will I choose to pay attention to what God might do? Will we prepare the way for Jesus? Now, when you think about the, the wilderness stories in the scripture, um, for some of you, maybe those of you who read the Bible through last year, the wilderness pops up all the time. Notice something interesting. When people are led into the wilderness, it's God who is leading them there. When the people are led out of Egypt, out of captivity, and into the wilderness, it's God who freed them and led them into to the wilderness and then leads them through it. When the prophets, some of the prophets are led out into the wilderness uh, to speak on behalf of God, it's, it's God's spirit that's leading them out into the wilderness. When the psalmist is speaking of the wilderness, it's often because God led the psalmist out into the wilderness for a specific reason, and God leads them through the wilderness. In a few weeks, we're going to talk about Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, and when you read that in Matthew, it says the spirit led Jesus, the spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness. God leads us into and through the wilderness because God works in the wilderness. And we have a chance to, to pay attention to that and to, to let God get our attention if we want to see it. Perhaps if this is where Jesus' ministry begins in the wilderness, then it's a new beginning place for us, for you or for me in this season. In the wilderness, God can get our attention. Number two, in the wilderness, Jesus reminds us that we need him to bear good fruit. This is also bear like the animal, just checked, you know, not naked fruit, okay? So Jesus reminds us we need him to bear good fruit. Here, John's using some pretty, pretty stark language about a tree and the axe cutting it down, um, pretty bold language. But Jesus uses a similar metaphor, doesn't he? In John 15, later on in his ministry, he talks about how apart from me, you can't bear fruit. But when you choose to abide or to remain with me, Jesus says, then you will bear fruit that will last. You will bear fruit that's abundant. And so John is already bringing that up here very early, that there is something about fruitfulness that is not going to happen without God and without Jesus in your life. And what happens when you don't have that is not either don't bear fruit or it's not good fruit. So think about it as uh, someone who's overseeing an orchard. I've never overseen an orchard, but I can imagine that if I did, if there was a tree or a few trees who were bearing bad fruit, that probably means that tree is diseased. And so what happens when a tree is diseased? You cut them down and you, put them, you make them into firewood because that's what they're good for because they can't bear good fruit anymore. This is the image that John is bringing up to the surface, that, that that's the reality. And he's warning these leaders, hey, God created you the people of Israel, to represent God and to bear good fruit, but that's not happening for some of you because you have gone apart from God and not stayed with God and followed God's way through the wilderness, but you're going your own way and you're not producing good fruit. So this brings up a good question for us. What fruit do we see in our lives? In the wilderness experiences of life, Jesus can remind us that we need to abide, we need him to bear good fruit. Listen, I, I, I think about the question, what fruit do I see in my life? And what I start to think about is to-do lists and maybe I need to try harder or maybe what we really need is better New Year's resolutions this time or to, to do the things we resolute this time. This is where our brains sometimes go. That's very cultural for some of us. But what I want us to remember is that what Jesus says is that it's not about what you can do. It's about what I can do through you so you got to stay with me. you got to remain with me. So perhaps... As we think about this next year, it's not time to try harder. It's not time to, to try to have some better New Year's resolutions. It's time to draw close to Jesus in a new way. Because that's the only hope to have fruit that will last. Finally, in the wilderness, the Holy Spirit refines and refocuses those who choose to follow. The Holy Spirit refines and refocuses. Uh, the imagery that we see John use here. Uh, to, to kind of finish off, he talks about how he's baptizing with water, but Jesus is going to come and baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, fire in this imagery is about refining, refining. 
burning away the things that are not necessary. And we see that is what fire does, right? And so here, there's this, this other picture, a farming picture now. Once again, I've never overseen an orchard or a farm, but I understand that at a farm, the, the, the idea of this fork and, he's, and, and the farmer is throwing the wheat in the air because what happens then is the wheat falls apart and then the, the, the part of the plant that's useful and is food stays here and then the chaff or the part that just it needs to fall away from the wheat grain uh, needs to be just thrown away and, and put in the fire. It's not, it's once again, it's useless again. It's the same image of, of the things that are not needed, that are not fruit, good fruit, good harvest. It just needs to be thrown out. And so you see the same picture again of, of refining the chaff, it's called. So you've got the wheat and the chaff and it's separated. And Jesus is going to do that. Jesus is going to refine and take away those things if you want the Holy Spirit to do that in your life. Now, once again, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are not open to this. We notice that in the rest of the story. But we have an opportunity to say, God, I want you to take some of the chaff in my life and burn it away. Like, for instance, that image you have of yourself that you know is not how God sees you. That's the kind of chaff that God wants to burn away as we go into this new year. That image you have of your neighbor or that person who you just don't understand because they're so different in their perspective. And you know that it's turned from not understanding to a different sense of not seeing them as a child of God. That's the kind of chaff that God wants to burn away. The, the spirit of discouragement that some of us have fell under, which is totally understandable, but that spirit of discouragement has caused us to not even look for what God might be doing anymore. I think that's the kind of chaff that God can burn away and refine in our life. That temptation that you're struggling with that just keeps coming back again and again. What if it's time to say, Jesus, lead me to what I need to do to get freedom? That's the kind of chaff, because of God's love, because of Jesus' love for us, wants to take that stuff out of our life. And it's often in the wilderness experience that Jesus can do that in our life. I've seen this in my own life. I've seen that the times of my life that I would call a wilderness time is when God has really refined me and helped me to, to shake off the things that's not what God wants for me because I'm one of God's kids. God doesn't want those things for me. How can I step into these new seasons? Often it comes from a wilderness experience. In the wilderness experiences of life, we can choose to let the Holy Spirit refine us and refocus us. And perhaps that's where some of us are at in this season. So there's kind of the summary. In the wilderness, God gets our attention if we will bear witness. In the wilderness, God is reminding us Jesus needs to be in our lives if we're going to have good fruit. And in the wilderness, we can choose to say, Holy Spirit, I want to be refined and refocused to seek your kingdom and not the other little kingdoms in the world. I've seen God work in wilderness experiences in my life. I hope you have as well. It's certainly not easy, is it? Pruning doesn't feel good. Have you seen the shears? Like, that's not a good, that doesn't feel good all the time. You know, the truth is, is that growth and fruitfulness is sometimes really challenging, too. Sometimes it's a lot of work. It's not easy. It's not comfortable. But I think that God's invitation to us is not to self-comfort or even to God comfort all the time, but also to self-care. I think God cares so much about us to say, I do want to comfort you, but I want to lead you into something new. And, and refocus you and refine you. When I think about these times in, the, in my life where I've seen God make a way in the wilderness or the stories that I've heard from you, I could tell stories for days because I've had the privilege and the honor to hear so many of your wilderness experiences and to be right there with you when I see God make a way that only God could make. Man, it's powerful to see that in your own life or in the lives of other people. And I believe in this, this new year we're going to see that. Because I look back on this last year and I think of how many stories that people told me where it was like a, a, a relationship was reconciled that would never be reconciled if it wasn't for God making a way. Because God works in the wilderness. I can think of stories of people who said, you know, I have never experienced the depth of community that I've experienced in the last couple of years, which seems almost like bizarre and ironic, but that's because God works in the wilderness. I know people who have recognized that, that they are experiencing some, some new freedom from some of their, their emotional health stuff because they finally said, all right, got to get some help, i got to get some support, some therapy, some people praying with me. And people are experiencing freedom that they've never had in their life. And they said, I didn't know I could experience life like this. That's the kind of way and work I've seen God do in the wilderness season. 
I think of there's at least 40 people, myself included, who are a part of these spiritual authority cohorts some of you are in. The, the whole idea is that we can pray with authority to have freedom spiritually in our life. And did you know that that wouldn't be possible for all those people to have that experience in living rooms on Zoom if it wasn't for the pandemic? How many things were available to people because of the pandemic in a new way? Because God works in the wilderness. I think of how many of you have these new ignited passions around different justice areas or, or for the, the, the people who are experiencing brokenness or injustice. There's new ways. I've watched some of you step with boldness into new actions. I've watched some of you have a new level of humility to say, I have a lot of learning to do when it comes to intercultural humility. I've seen people taking steps and actions of racial justice because of what? The wilderness. Because God works in the wilderness. And we can bear witness to that. Some of you know Ryan and Stacey May and the, this family of five. They were the first family to buy a house here in northeast Minneapolis. I don't even know if you knew the rest of us were going to come with you. You're like, well, we're doing it. I uh, hope everybody else comes. And, and you know what? That's been an amazing thing. That was an amazing story when that happened. But here now, years later, her husband Ryan is in a wheelchair. He needs an accessible built house to live in because of his MS. Now, that seemed impossible. I'm telling you, two weeks ago, that seemed impossible. Did it not? It seemed impossible to, to find that in an affordable way, but through a long story that I'm hoping that Stacy will write down for all of us. Because of people's generosity and because of prayer and because of, of God appointment relationships with people selling a house, next month they're going to move into an accessible house with an elevator. <laughs> I mean, that's crazy. But do, do you see? Only God could make that happen. God makes a way in the wilderness, and the May family has seen more wilderness than they need to have ever seen in their life. They've got more wilderness experiences than their fair share. But it's because of the challenge and because of the wilderness that we get the excitement of seeing God do something that only God could do. God making a way that only God could make. God doing a work that only God could do, and we get a chance to bear witness to that. So as we go into this next year, there's going to be challenges. But we get a chance to bear witness to what God might do in those wilderness experiences. And they're not all going to end in celebrations like this last week. I mean, literally, it was like a week where it went from impossible to they're moving into the house next month. That celebration won't always be the case, will it? There's going to be celebration. There's going to be lament. There's going to be everything in between. But God works in all of it because God works in the wilderness. We've seen it in the past, and we're going to see it as we move forward into 2022. I'm going to have the band come up. When I think about this in our lives, I see this reality and this invitation that we have to pray that the kingdom of God would come, that God's reign would come in these situations. We don't get to have control over that, do we? But when God's reign comes into a situation, it changes reality, doesn't it? And so we pray desperately, God, bring your reign, your kingdom, to the, to the experiences we're having in our personal life, in our city, in our world, in our neighborhoods, and we get to see glimpses of the kingdom of God coming knowing that in the future Jesus will come and the rain will take over the entire earth, praise God, because of what Jesus has done for us. So we have this opportunity together to say, God, I want to trust that you do work in the wilderness. Whether you're in a season like that or somebody near you is, I'll tell you that right now, will we trust that God works in the wilderness and will we choose to bear witness to that? And just like Cousin John said, the kingdom of heaven is near. And my prayer for us as a community in 2022 is that we would have eyes to perceive it and that we would join in that kingdom as we see it in our midst. Amen.